the end of the 12-year reign of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He has had numerous opportunities to form a coalition government, but has failed. There have been four elections in the space of two years, and all of them have ended unsuccessfully for Netanyahu. It would appear to be the end of Benjamin Netanyahu's political career. It's certainly the end of his time as Prime Minister. But I wanted to watch with you a video of Benjamin Netanyahu, or Ben Netai, as he called himself, all the way back in 1978, and just compare the things that were being said back then with how things are now and how they have been over the past few years under his premiership. So let's hear from Ben Natai all those years ago. PLO state is a deadly danger to world peace because it is a surest guarantee of increased terrorism and war, however noble the idea may sound. I call now as my first witness, Mr. Benjamin Natai. Benjamin Natai. I wonder when he changed his name. A lot of the Ashkenazi European Jews that headed to Israel did Hebrewize their names upon arrival when they were trying to rekindle this language and kind of create an Israeli identity, which of course didn't exist uh, at the point at which the state was created. There was no such thing as an Israeli. They weren't even sure uh, what they would call the state once it was founded. But let's hear from Benjamin Natai. Natai is a graduate of MIT. He is an Israeli, and he is a man who has written widely on this question before the House tonight. He is a graduate of MIT. He spent a lot of his youth in America, did Bibi Netanyahu, and that's why he always spoke English with a very noticeable American accent. Mr. Natai, is the issue of self-determination the core of the conflict in the Middle East? No, I don't believe it is. The real core of the conflict is the unfortunate Arab refusal to accept the state of Israel. And I think, as was mentioned earlier, for 20 years the Arabs had both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And if self-determination were, as they now say, the core of the conflict, they could have easily established a Palestinian state then, but they didn't. So from 1948, the year of the Nakba, up until 1967, the Six-Day War, Gaza was occupied by Egypt and the West Bank and East Jerusalem were occupied and administered by Jordan. And he's pointing out that at no point during those nearly two decades was there any call for a Palestinian state to be created and I think during that time the focus was probably on return and the refugees who'd been kicked out only two decades before were still dreaming of going home and you had the PLO and the PFLP the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, this very left-wing uh, organization. And I remember their emblem is like an arrow pointing back into Palestine. The emphasis being on return, returning to your homes, regardless of what state uh, they were in, these people just wanted to go back. So I think that's important to remember, and that was definitely the focus of the Palestinian struggle for the first couple of decades, the right of return, because it was very much alive uh, and a possibility, uh, not just a dream that is now 70 years old. Where did the issue arise then? Well, for 20 years, we didn't hear a word about self-determination. And in fact, what we did hear those of us living in the Middle East, was about driving the Jews into the sea. Now, after 1967, 
under the leadership of the PLO, the hardline strategy shifted to adopting a moderate dressed up slogan, which uh, now talked in terms of first a secular democratic state and then replaced it with Palestinian self-determination. But what this really means, contrary to what Mr. Aruri said uh, about 1977 being a changed year in the PLO's uh, objective, <clears throat> let me quote you what the PLO Information Office said in a Dutch paper in 1977, in May 5th. 77? May 5th, 1977, yes. The statement was very simple. Our objective remains the destruction of the Zionist State of Israel. So let's keep in mind that what we're talking about here is not the attempt to build a state, but to destroy one. Do the Palestinians have a right to a separate state? Well, Mr. John has been talking about human rights. Well, I think that it's, no, I don't think they do, but I think that it's quite instructive that the Palestinians who are invoking the right of uh, uh, self-determination, which is, a, is an attribute for separate nations, themselves are the ones who define themselves as part of the Arab nation. Now, no one is denying that there are Palestinian Arabs. There's a very distinguished Palestinian Arab sitting right next to me. But the Palestinians themselves, in the Palestinian National Covenant, the very first article, say that the people of Palestine, quote, are part of the Arab nation. Well, let's look at the Arab nation. It has 21 states, an area roughly the size of the United States, and one-sixth of the entire world's wealth. Now, add to that the fact that there already exists a Palestinian state, and that is Jordan, 60% of whose population is Palestinian. It's, I think... That's an interesting point. 60% of the population of Jordan, I think it's possibly even higher now, are Palestinian or have a Palestinian background. Now that is because the Palestinians were driven out of Palestine and into Jordan, across the River Jordan, the Transjordan, as it was known. And a popular argument among the Zionists is that there are 22 Arab countries. Why do you need another one? Look at all this land from Morocco to Iraq. They are all Arabs. There's nothing different or unique about a Palestinian. Uh, so why should they have their own state? Okay. Does that mean that it's okay to drive people out of their land? Does that mean that if people left the place that they were born, they shouldn't be allowed to return there just because they speak the same language as someone else? If people from abroad came and drove people out of Wales all the way up into Scotland, they would still have the right to go back and live in Wales regardless of the fact that Scotland is also part of the United Kingdom and in Scotland and Wales they all nowadays speak English. I think it's quite interesting that Yasser Arafat and King Hussein, who are bitter enemies, agree on one thing, that Jordan is a Palestinian state. So what we're talking about is a demand for a 22nd Arab state and a second Palestinian state. What should, be, what should be done with the Palestinians on the West Bank? It's a problem, so what should be done about it, in your opinion? Well, I think that the Palestinians in the West Bank are going to be offered the full human rights, the full civil rights, as there are no Arabs are offered in the Middle East. No Arabs whatsoever have any full human rights or the right to vote for their own government. Those Arabs who lived in Israel in the pre-67 boundaries are the only Arabs in the Middle East who offer that right, and I'm all in favor of having the same Arabs living in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip being offered such a right in the final peace agreement. And we have. Uh... That's very interesting what he just said there. This is sounding like he wants to extend Israeli citizenship, not nationality, because in Israel your nationality is either Jewish or Arab, but you, there are Arabs with Israeli citizenship. And that sounded very much like he was in favor of extending. Israeli citizenship to the Palestinian inhabitants of the West Bank and Gaza. Now, I bet he's gone off that idea, because were he 
to do that today and if those Palestinian Arabs were given the right to vote combined with the Arab population within Israel proper they would constitute a majority of the electorate and they would elect a Palestinian prime minister of the one state solution that he's talking about so I imagine later in life he went off that idea but that's very interesting to hear him say that on camera peace in the Middle East very briefly please yes I sincerely hope so look I'm 28 years old I've had to defend my country in two wars and in many battles nobody wants peace more than Israel but the stumbling block to the road for peace is this demand for a PLO state, which will mean more war, which will mean more violence in the Middle East. And I think, I sincerely believe, if this demand is abandoned, we can have real and genuine peace. Thank you. you see how afraid he is of the PLO, and he's against a PLO state. Nowadays, we hear all about Hamas. Hamas, Hamas, Hamas are the problem. There was no Hamas in 1978, when this was being filmed. But... The PLO were resisting back then, so they were this demonized enemy. And now that Hamas have the popular support of the Palestinian people, uh, the Israelis want to do business with Fatah and the PLO, and they want to go back to the PLO. Well, you had many, many decades of opportunities to negotiate something, to offer something to the PLO and it didn't work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Mr. Adjami. Mr. Adjami, some questions for Mr. Natai. Mr. Natai. You told everyone that the Palestinians on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip will enjoy full human rights. Could you tell me how that's compatible with the presence of Israeli forces in their midst? Well, uh, the Arabs living now under, the Arabs who lived in Israel, 400,000 of them, 400,000, uh, between 1948 and 67, as I said earlier, certainly enjoy full human rights. And as I I'm said, they're the only about ones. the Arabs in Israel. I'm talking... They didn't for the first uh, couple of decades, actually, but eventually they did. About the Arabs on the West Bank yes, yes. and the Gaza Strip. If you let me, I'll answer your question, Mr. Ajani, please. Uh, the Arabs living in Israel are the only ones who are entitled to vote for their governments, the only ones who have representative in a parliament in the entire Middle East. Now, it's true that the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are now undergoing a period of transition. In fact, no Arab government has been willing to negotiate so far about this period of transition. Mm -hmm. And I think that when this transition, when negotiation period is ended, th there is no reason why under either Jordanian citizenship or Israeli citizenship, these Arabs will not have the full human rights, the right to vote for their representatives, as the Arabs in Israel do, as hopefully all the Arabs in the Middle East will do someday. So there he said it. Either Israeli citizenship or Jordanian citizenship. So he's obviously thinking about redrawing the borders and making parts of the West Bank, perhaps, uh, going back to Jordan, he doesn't want a Palestinian state at all costs, but he is open to this idea of some of the Palestinians becoming, as they call them, Arab Israelis. So, does the state of Israel itself accept that the, the people on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip have the right to vote on whatever future they choose? Well, Mr. Ajami, we just, I just uh, outlined that in the event that this negotiation process will continue, I'm sure that what we're talking about is, in fact, eventual citizenship of some kind, either Jordanian or Israeli or in any other arrangement, in which these people will certainly vote. Mr. Natai, you've given yourself the right to determine that you are an Israeli, but you've also given yourself the right to negate the other entity, which I think is not somehow consistent with global practice at this time, is it? Mr. Ajami, I have never, never rejected another entity, nor have I ever declared my intent to destroy it least of all the Palestinian Arabs who I fervently want to live in peace with. All I'm saying is that it is the Palestinian Arabs themselves, their leaders, Arafat, Muhsin, who Morris uh, Abrams quoted earlier, 
Farouk Adumi, the number two man in the PLO, these are the ones who say they are part of the Arab nation. These are the ones who say they already have a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. There is no right to establish a second one on my doorstep. Okay, Mr. Natai, the... ...sizing that, well, if you're Arab and you don't need Palestinian identity uh, on top of it. You seem like a very patriotic Israeli. Does not the fact of Israeli dependence upon the U.S. in order to maintain its occupation on the West Bank and the Gaza, does this not trouble you at all? Uh, Mr. Ajami, I have, you asked me as a patriotic Israeli, and I'll answer as someone who has fought in the Middle East. Uh, one of the things that I think is unique about Israel in terms of all Americans allies, all America's allies, is that it is perhaps the only one who has taken care of itself so far. And I would think that America, in fact, it's not a one-way street, Israel taking from the United States. Israel is giving the United States an extraordinary bargain in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It's the one stable democratic ally which the United States can count on. Mr. Natai, inasmuch as you're a Zionist and are committed to a Jewish state, given the fact that demographic predictions tell us that there will be an Arab majority within the current borders of Israel, does this not challenge the foundation of the very state which you are committed to? Uh, I know of the latest uh, figures, population figures, that actually show a decrease in the Arab birth rate, particularly in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, mm -hmm. as a result of the higher education and the universal education for women that didn't exist prior to Israel, uh, prior to 1967. Now, if you ask me, would I reject Palestinians or Arabs living in, in our midst? Ridiculous. Of course not. They're part of, they're citizens of Israel. If they... No, no, I'm talking about the West Bank and Gaza. You see, we're still going back oh, to yes, the core yes. of it. Yes, I agree. Whatever okay. will be the final arrangement. These people should be free to multiply as they wish. I think that it is the final arrangement. This is footage from 1978. Occupations are meant to be temporary. That is a condition of a military occupation and the occupation is still ongoing. It's interesting that he talks about the final arrangement. Written in the Bible, multiply and uh, be fruitful. I think these people should have that right. I'm not going to start uh, enforcing a birth control program under any circumstances. Thank you. Birth control program. That was for the Ethiopians later on. But it's interesting to look at this now, uh, knowing that the, as it emerged, the Arab birth rate did accelerate. And if you draw a line from river to sea and divide uh, the population up. The Arab-Palestinian population does slightly outweigh the Israeli-Jewish population. And what the Zionists wanted, a Jewish state on all of the territory of historic Palestine and have it be a democratic state was impossible. You couldn't square that circle because they didn't have enough Jewish people to outnumber the Arab and Palestinian population. That biblical injunction I came to. Mr. Abram, one more question to Mr. Natai. Mr. Natai, since the subject is what should the United States do, may I ask you if you could summarize why, in your opinion, the United States should oppose the creation of a PLO state? I think the United States should oppose the creation of a Palestinian state for several reasons. The first one being that it is unjust to demand the creation of a 22nd Arab state and a second Palestinian state at the expense of the only Jewish state. I think it also would defeat the hopes of those moderate Palestinians who genuinely want to reach a peace accommodation with Israel. A 22nd Arab state. Was it really the case that apartheid South Africa had a right to operate as such because the black South Africans could have just gone and lived in any one of the other majority black countries in Africa? I don't think so. Thank you. Mr. I... Mr. Jami, another question. Mr. Natai, as someone who would say that you believe in democracy, do you believe that Israel can, can continue as a garrison state and still remain a democratic state? Mr. Jami, either you didn't hear what I said before, or for your benefit, I'll repeat it again. No, Israel is, does not intend to remain a garrison state. Israel wants to live in peace and wants to be secure. If that is called, ma involves maintaining uh, military guarantees, our own military guarantees against the destruction uh, of people who surround us, yes, I believe we should fight for our survival. 
If I have to, I'll fight again, but I hope not to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adonis. Mr. Natai, thank you for joining us on the Advocates. Well, there you have it, Mr. Natai, as a young man who has now completed his career. He's served his country many times and he's fought in wars. And he said that he didn't wish to fight again. But from that time onwards, unfortunately, he did spill quite a lot of Palestinian blood. Thank you for watching that with me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll try and bring you another similar analysis sometime soon. Thank you for watching.